We've heard a lot about some of the positive things that technology does, some of the opportunities that it uh, opens up, some of the efficiencies it creates. Uh, but there are industries that are challenged by new technology, particularly by communications technology and social media. Uh, one of those is the media, which is going through what we, uh, we at high call a media morphosis. Uh, we've we've uh, put together a little video to set out the problem, and then I have some guests that are going to come and talk to, uh, talk to you about how uh, those old power structures, how media, how politics, how big brands are coming to terms with this new world where people can speak directly back uh, to, to institutions that were previously uh, dedicated to broadcast and not necessarily to conversation. So uh, we have a little video to show you to begin with. The media is in crisis. These days with Twitter, Facebook, smartphones and tablets, we're consuming more news than ever before. But no one has worked out how to finance a newsroom. It seems like consumers just don't want to pay for news. And advertising on the internet doesn't pay for a news operation like print advertising used to. In most countries, newspaper sales are nosediving. Some media organizations think that only high quality journalism funded by subscriptions will survive the digital revolution. Others are desperately producing waves of frivolity to keep up with our insatiable appetite for gossip and scandal. The way stories are being told is changing too. While old school journalists are still stuck indoors getting their news from social media, the best stories are being told by feisty young reporters on the front lines of the action. Companies like BuzzFeed and Vice are making a lot of money with their informative but humorous approach. While newspapers struggle to find their identities online, the survival of the press is essential for our democracy. Professional journalists keep our politicians honest and keep a watchful eye on the excesses of big business. But are the days of properly financed investigative journalism coming to an end? that question I'm, I'm very sure is, is no uh, and I can't think of anybody uh, better to, to explain why that's not the case than our next guest we're very lucky to have him uh, please welcome to the stage Matthias Delfner um, the CEO of Axel Springer thank you so much for joining us can I get a glass of wine? Of course. <laughs> God. The you one know, I, I forget. No, I really like that approach because in the, in the analog media world, in every TV show, people were drinking bottles of wine. And then in the last years, it started to be not politically correct and people mm -hmm. could only drink mineral water during the talk shows. Yes. So I appreciate very much that the digital economy is sure, well, I mean, revitalizing as, as, that tradition. As an investor in high, it's basically your wine, so I mean, you're welcome. It's <laughs> <laughs> 49% your wine. So um, probably <laughs> where our people re recommended that. Uh, okay, um, now, I, I uh, don't mind telling you, I've, I've, I've been an admirer of Axel Springer's because I, yeah, I've come from the UK where um, media groups like The Guardian and The Telegraph do a lot of talking about addressing the new challenges that face uh, media companies and the new challenges that, 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 that face uh, financing journalism, but they don't really do very much about it. And I'd like you just to sketch out for us ver um, very briefly um, what you've done to re-architect the business um, of Axel Springer, the way that the company operates, the way that it makes its money, um, to, to really tackle these challenges head on and be proactive about them in a way that I haven't seen happen in the UK. Well, in a way, it's very complicated and very simple. Instead of thinking too much about crisis, I heard that term again and I hate it, we thought about opportunities. And seriously, I think that this digitization is a tremendous opportunity for a branded content company. I mean, what are the four big evolutions or developments uh, of mankind? First, it's the uh, language, because without language, there's no communication. Second was uh, writing. Without writing, there is no civilization. Then it was printing, because without printing, there was no democratization of uh, knowledge. And now it's the fourth big thing, that's the digitization. So to work in a, in a content industry, 
and be able to shape the development of a media company at a very early stage of that revolution, I think it's one of the most fascinating uh, things that can happen in your life. So we, we, from the very beginning, embraced the pro progress and thought, let's stick in a way to our core competencies, competencies. Let's not try to reshape a media company by investing into e-commerce and try to become a digital retailer. That's not our business. We said there are three things that we know well. That's how to create the best possible content. Second, how to monetize it towards uh, advertising clients. And thirdly, how to use the reach in order to uh, do classified ad businesses. That's what a media company did in the last decades. And that's basically what we are doing in the digital world. We are either launching or buying content portals. We are launching or buying marketing companies, particularly performance-based marketing companies. And thirdly, uh, classified ad portals. And with that, we are now generating 47% of our profits with online businesses. And we have achieved seven years in a row record profits. So I really cannot see a crisis. I see uh, many opportunities. So it sounds pretty good from where you're sitting, right? Um, so I mean, I would like to ask you about some of the investments that, that you make because uh, you know uh, Axel Springer is making some um, you know you're, you're you're spending quite a lot of money um, trying out new things right um, buying buying businesses and, and uh, could you talk us there's no free lunch in life I mean that's clear <laughs> <laughs> no I mean it's it's terrific for the it's terrific for startups I mean it's wonderful um, one of the great things about it from from my point of view is you know the, the difference between the Berlin ecosystem and London uh, is that you know the the o the overarching presence in London is the government with this sort of PR outfit Tech City and here uh, Springer and Deutsche Telekom are, are really you know sincerely investing in this scene which I, I, I find I find um, unusual uh, and, and 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 a delight to see um, but I'd like, I'd like to ask you about um, if, if there's a specific investment that you've made that, um, that has worked particularly well. Um, the reason I ask the, que ask the question is, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of content companies and foremost marketing companies are thinking, well, what, what's my exit route? Who am I going to sell to? Um, you know, I, I, I'm keen to, get an idea, keen to get an idea from you of the kinds of businesses that excite you, that, that perform well um, after acquisition, because, of course, it doesn't always go well. Well, there's a, there's a long list in a way. I could start with Idealo, uh, a company that was number five in the market. After the Springer investment, it went up to market leadership. I could talk about Xanox. It was the number two. And Trade Doubler was twice as big as Xanox. Today, Xanox is twice as big as Trade Doubler. I could talk about Stepstone that gained after our acquisition in the first year, after the 100% take, over 80% uh, of growth. Uh, I could talk about Kaufta, that's a very recent uh, acquisition that we have made um, that uh, was in one market when we bought it and it is uh, not even two years after the acquisition present in five markets and very successfully so and very profitable. So there are many examples. The, 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 the story behind it is that we are deeply convinced and we have to prove it towards our shareholders that the combination of an online-only company and Axel Springer with its tremendous reach, its infrastructure internationally, with its marketing power, with its sales organization, with its content, that this combination is adding value. If the online company on a standalone basis could perform as well or even better than without Axel Springer, then there is no need for Axel Springer to invest in or to buy it, and there is no reason for any shareholder to invest in Axel Springer shares. So only if we can, in a very credible way, prove that the combination is adding value, then it makes sense and then it's a, it's a convincing story. And I think we have proven that. So it is because of the, of the toolbox of instruments that we provide and then these online companies can use and take in order to drive their businesses faster. But it, I think it is also to do, apart from that, with a cultural approach. If we would have the cultural approach of a uh, uh, colonial superpower that is invading these uh, startups and telling these people how to do their business, businesses better, then I think we would, fo would fail immediately. We have a respect for the variety and diversity of different corporate cultures, and in a way we appreciate the, the culture of a younger digital company being it a startup or a more developed business model. We appreciate, in a way, to learn from that from that culture. And I guess this is pretty different from the places you normally hang out, right? You know, I mean, there's sort of very, very sort of. You know uh, what? It's not that unusual. I don't feel like in a zoo. I mean, I'm frequently. <laughs> adding, I, that's really not. <laughs> these enormous things. You don't see these yeah. in the journalist club, right? <laughs> Let me ask you. I like that design, by the way. I it's, think it's beautiful. It's Our designer, design. Catherine, is, is. I also is, like is, your is, socks, but the design is even better. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Actually, I didn't. I didn't plan this very well. I didn't really go with the color. But. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about Culture Clash, actually. Um, 
have you found some of your executives to be resistant to, to this change? And I, I'm, I, want, I want to ask ultimately about how, the, how uh, journalism is changing mm -hmm. as a result of the new, t mm -hmm. new, new consumption You're habits. You're more but referring to the before, culture change. Before, the I, yeah, before, I, before yeah. I do ask you about that, mm -hmm. within, the, within the business, mm -hmm. I mean, I know from, yeah. from spending time at the Telegraph that you know, there's, a, there's quite a clear division in most media groups yeah. between um, people who get it and people who don't. Um, and, and I'm guessing that's the same at Springer. Well, they will tell you there wasn't a problem, it would be a lie. I mean, of course, there were a lot of problems and a lot of uh, resistance against that at the beginning. And then I think we made a very, very important fundamental decision. We said, okay, we may not separate the analog guys from the digital guys. We may not allow any silos where some people are responsible for the digital growth and others are responsible to defend the, the analog core business. That makes no sense because then you would have, let's say, 10% of the new kids on the block who are responsible for growth and 90% trying to fight against them. And it's clear who is winning that game, the people who are defending the past or the present. So we said, okay, let's put all people together and share responsibility. Every person in our company is responsible for the digitization of its content, of its brand, of its business model, of its service. So there is no analog only business anymore so in the company. There's nowhere to hide for those people who are only interested exactly. in newspapers. And either yeah. you add, either you you somehow take that opportunity and really try to digitize your business and yourself in a way or you are not part of the family anymore. And I think that helped a great deal. It took a little longer at the beginning. It was a hard path to go, but in the end, I think it, it's much better now because we have only winners in that transformation. There are no losers. And I think that helps to create that spirit of change. Sure. Um, let me ask you now about journalism, because you're a journalist in addition to being the chief executive of, of, of a company. Um, how, I mean, in, in, in your experience, how has the kinds of journalism that you're producing changed um, with this, with this new, this new world where you know, like people want to consume things on all sorts of platforms. They want more content all the time. Yeah. They want to argue with the journalists. They want to, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a pretty thankless job, frankly, um, particularly being a columnist. Yeah. Um, you know, you write something, and there are you know 50 wackos on the internet who want to tell you that you know you deserve to burn in hell for you know for expressing a perfectly normal opinion. Um, you know, there are another 50 pedants who want to like correct your grammar or change you know or, or, or pick you up on facts. And you know, there, there's just enough time and there's not time enough in the world to, to deal with all of this. Have you found that it's that it's changed the the sort of journalistic product that Springer produces? Um, because I, I, I've noticed in, yeah. in the UK, there's been this sort of race to the bottom of creating ever more drivel, um, particularly, particularly at the Guardian, for example. Um, you know, it's just. <laughs> but I, I don't agree with their politics. That's a different issue. Um, no, I mean, you know, they're just churning out, uh, churning out mountains of, 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 of basically meaningless content, hoping desperately that ads are going to cover, going to cover it, um, and, and sort of doing this sort of feigned engagement where you know it, it sort of devalues the quality of the journalism. You lose that critical distance. I'm just interested in what your approach has been, um, given that you own such huge media properties in Germany. Um, have, you, have you decided to sort of try to try to maintain journalistic integrity and distance, or are you trying to kind of get readers involved in the conversation, which to me always sounds like a little bit of a hedge? Of course, the digitization has changed journalism, and I think to the better. I'm deeply convinced that digital journalism is going to be the better journalism. And that's why we have decided not to defend the idea of analog journalism in the sense that the quality of journalism can only pre be preserved if it's printed on paper that is made uh, out of trees. I don't get that point. It's a, it's a question now about uh, the, 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 the medium that is... Uh, bringing the, the news or the story to their readers, but it's not about the content itself. So I, that's why we have redefined our strategy and said we want to become the leading digital media company in our segments that we have defined and not a multimedia company, and that's why we don't want to defend the newspapers. So digital journalism, why is it better? First of all, you have more space, so you can have very in-depth reporting because you have unlimited space. Second, you are much faster. You can react immediately on an on a, uh, event. Uh, thirdly, you have interactivity, so you have the intelligence of your readers. What a wonderful resource. We have millions of new reporters who are contributing with photos, contributing with stories, contributing with the correction of wrong figures and facts. Uh, so, in a way, the, this interactiv interactivity make, makes you smarter. Then, and that is very important that at a very early stage, you have access to all different kinds of, of, of media. You have access to written information, but also to video content and to uh, audio uh, uh, elements in it. And I think from a creative point of view, digital journalism is at a very, very early 
undeveloped faith. I think the creative possibilities and the aesthetic possibilities of digital journalism are completely undiscovered. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited now that in the next years and decades, we can invent these things. We can really launch new products and they will be better than their analog products. I'm deeply convinced. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I found the whole snowfall thing, the New York Times product, to be quite, quite unimpressive and uninspiring. And I mean, I know that a lot of people were, were, were you know, really excited about that. But I thought when, when you think about, you know, I mean, you, you and I are people who have journalists who have contact with, with this kind of this world and entrepreneurs, and you think what's possible mm -hmm. and what hasn't been done yet. Mm -hmm. um, it struck me as actually quite, quite cautious and yeah. conservative, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, well, I'd like to bring on somebody else to help us to, to, to talk to uh, talk with us about how um, you know big institutions are dealing with this new world. Uh, and so uh, we have we've uh, also, also lucky to have a member of parliament from uh, the UK, uh, Connor Burns. Um, if you'd like to come up, please, Connor. Now I know you drink white wine. I certainly do. By the bucket load, I'm told. And we have to declare it in the public sector. <laughs> All right. So, I'm, I know that you have a couple of good stories about uh, your experiences engaging with the public. Uh, now, we've been talking a little bit about how journalism changes when you, when you uh, have uh, people who can imme immediately respond to you. As a politician, um, do you find that uh, the public in general are a bunch of nutcases that are best avoided and kept away from? Or are you grateful for the sort of communicative opportunities that you now have? Because it seems to me like, you know, as a politician, you're kind of harangued into joining Twitter, you're bullied into setting up a Facebook page, and what do you get for your trouble? A load of weirdos kind of abusing you. Um, what, what's your experience of that? My experience of it is, is very, very mixed. It can be hugely positive. It puts you in touch with people who wouldn't have been able to get in touch with a member of parliament before they'd have had to write a letter. You can now instantly respond to them. It also, I find, people will, will say things to you on Twitter and in an email that they wouldn't dream of writing down in a letter and posting to somebody because they probably want to, to sleep on it. When my great friend Margaret Thatcher died recently, uh, I had a lovely email from somebody when I'd done a tribute speech to her in parliament who said, dear Mr. Burns, I think you should go and see your doctor uh, you need an operation to remove your tongue from a certain part of her anatomy. Now, I don't think that anyone would have ever sat down and, and wrote that. The interesting thing for me is that we have never been more connected as a political class directly to our electorates, but we have never seemed more remote to the public than we do in the digital age. Politicians who complain about the digital age, um, they're going to fail. It's a reality. You have to deal with it. I'm sure there were politicians around when newspapers started who, who thought they were a terrible invasion uh, into Hansard, which, you know, which was, Tony Blair, Ben used to joke, Hansard was the only newspaper in Britain not owned by Rupert Murdoch. But we, now there's a plethora of opportunities for people to express views. It's warmly welcome to me. I think instead of complaining, I would be happy if more politicians, I know that it is different and much better in the UK, but in Germany and other European countries, so many politicians complain about the digitization, but they don't know enough about it. And I think that's a big political mistake, mm. because if it's true that the digital world is, in a way, redefining our uh, civilization to a certain degree, then politicians should be absolutely uh, on the forefront of the knowledge about it. Mm. I suppose the only, the only danger with, with partic in particular social networking is it does have a trivializing effect, doesn't it? I mean, you know, the, these guys kind of t tweet perfectly reasonable things about their pets and their holidays, and you guys kind of pick up on, you know, misspellings or accidental tweets, and somehow that's supposed to be newsworthy. And we all do it, you know, it's, 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 every media group publishes stuff like this. It does seem to have a bit of a trivializing effect when people take these kind of throwaway utterances and treat them as, like, you know, sort of published statements. Mm -hmm. So I suppose I, I would worry a little, bit, a little bit about that. I mean, the, 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 the solution, presumably, is to, is to tweet safely, like well, you do. Do you not think it's also an opportunity for the mainstream, the traditional media, actually to find new sources of material uh, to publish? For, I'll give you an example. I, I tweeted a couple of weeks ago when the, the, that poor soldier was beheaded in central London by the Islamic fundamentalists. Mm. And you have this inane debate going on in Britain that we should ban them from the airwaves. So I tweeted, we shouldn't ban these people from the airways, we should have them on, and we should expose their evil creed that hates our freedoms. Mm. And the best way of exposing that is to have them on. 
doing that through Twitter was actually picked up by a lot of the mainstream press. Yeah. Uh, they're going to the it's Twitter and so on. You have that sort of J.S. Mill libertarianism of, 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 the, of the, the right. It seems to take very naturally to this sort of transparent new, new media. Okay, um, let's bring somebody else on uh, who can talk about another kind of big uh, institution and how it communicates uh, in, in, this, in this disorientating new environment. I want to bring on uh, Konstantin Bjarka from Crane TV. Uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about how luxury brands are dealing with some of these problems. Thanks for joining us. You look delightful today, by the way. This jacket's lovely. Um, so, I'm going to assume you. What, what can I get you? you uh, a glass of white would be lovely. White would be lovely. Okay, good. Um, talk to us a little bit about these problems from the point of view. I mean, you, you work uh, daily with with Gucci, Dior, with these luxury brands, right? And you're helping them to find new ways to, to communicate their brand messages and and to communicate with their customers. Um, talk, talk to us a little bit about how the um, how those strategies have changed in the last, say, five years? So I think um, the, the first thing that we're seeing is that there's a decline of consumer appetite for, for, for paid advertising. Um, on the internet, you see north of 80%, thank you, of uh, users skipping ads. Um, and, um, and obviously, sort of print advertising is, is quite difficult to measure because you don't know whether anyone's actually looked at the ad. Um, how long they engaged with it, whether they showed it to someone else, etc. And, and so the internet provides a fantastic opportunity um, for these brands to actually become more like media companies and to start telling their stories. And the reason why these companies are successful in, in the first place is because they, they have skills and know-how um, that, that makes them very unique and very successful. So now, with, in, in the age of, of, of the internet, they have an opportunity suddenly to tell these stories. Um, and that is something that is, is now is sort of the buzzwords of earned media um, and native advertising and content marketing, which, is, um, which provides a fantastic opportunity for them to invest in telling their stories, which then users um, share across the web for them. And no longer do they have to go and buy silly little MPUs and banners and skyscrapers or, or pages in, in a newspaper, um, but people will go and tell these stories for them. And, and so I think that's one of the big changes that, that we're seeing at the moment. What's interesting about your, your business is, I mean, people often as, uh, associate the internet with um, declining quality, uh, whether it's in journalism, whether it's the, you don't, I know, uh, but um, you know, whether it's the move to sort of user-generated video on YouTube, you know, the sort of race, race to the bottom thing. Um, but, but you're one of those businesses operating on the internet and, and, and representing, um, you know, the, 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 these luxury brands. Actually, uh, let's, let's watch a video briefly that explains what it is that Constantine's business Crane does. Crane TV is an online magazine that creates and distributes culture-based video and events to a global audience. With over a thousand videos focusing on art, design, style and travel themes, Crane TV stands for a lifestyle that inspires others to explore the world for themselves. In developing an editorial approach that transcends sex, creed and age, Crane TV appeals to a mindset rather than a strict demographic. We have established a rich content ecosystem that allows our audience to pull Crane TV into their world. Whether it's streamed online, watched when traveling, or found via our syndication partners, our content is consumed in over 150 countries around the world. Our fans subscribe to, interact with, and invite Crane into their social networks for a daily dialogue. So it seems like um, the, the barriers that were traditionally uh, up between, let's say, content producers and journalists, you know, um, and let's say agencies, PR agencies, marketing, it all seems to be breaking down a little bit. I mean, do you, have, you, have you experienced any of this in, you know, let's say, paid print content? Um, do you, I mean, do you do any of that? Have you noticed the sort of the, the creep of advertorial? Yeah, I mean, it's a general trend also in the uh, analog world that this... Um, let's say, clear separation between advertising and editorial content is uh, somehow um, more flexible. And I think that's not a good development. And uh, I think, for me, it's not a digital or analog question. I think, in general, you should be able to distinguish what is what. If it's clearly indicated that it's an advertorial, I'm fine with that. But if it's a kind of hidden uh, agenda that people uh, try to get across, then I have a problem with that. Mm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think transparency is, is one of the well, sort of founding principles and characteristics of the internet, and and, and clearly that, that needs to be true when, when it's a brand message or, or not. I think people just generally need to know who the author is of what they're consuming, um, totally regardless 
of, of whether this is a media company, a brand, uh, an NGO, or, or a politician. Um, and ultimately, the decision whether someone's going to consume that content, regardless of who the author is, is whether it's good content. And it doesn't matter who creates it. If it's entertaining, inspirational, and inf informational, I'll, I'll happily consume it. And I don't care who created it. I'm going to invite Nico to come on and explain what he's been up to recently. This is quite an interesting version of venture capital that, 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 that uh, speaks to what we've been talking about. Um, Nico, if you could explain briefly what it is that you do for people who, who don't know, because I find this quite an interesting spin on, on, uh, on venture capital, and it has a, has a bearing on, on most of the people on stage. You mean I don't get any wine? No, that's fine, Milo, that's fine. I don't drink cheap wine anyway. That's okay, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> oh. You definitely don't now. Um, Mr. Durfner's wine is lovely, thank you very much. <laughs> no, I, found, I found the discussion just now very, very interesting, and I think that media itself is not in a crisis. I think the advertising business model, to a certain extent, is in a crisis. And um, media companies are diversifying, and they're earning their revenues through very many different types of new revenue models. And one of those is investing. And so what we've done is we've founded a venture capital-type fund that basically invests in startups, but it doesn't use cash to do this. It uses advertising inventory supplied by different media groups. And so what we're doing is we're basically helping media companies monetize using an investment model instead of a different types of revenue model. Thank you. Um, and uh, and you, you have some news that you would like to share with us, I think. Yes, I'm, I'm, thank you, by the way, for hosting us. And thank you to Ido and Hans for making this great event possible. And, um, we are, um, have a really amazing announcement today. So we've basically completed our first fund, German Media Pool One. We've been investing for three years now. And uh, we've made eight investments um, with three media partners. So one of those is JC Deco, which is the worldwide leader in out-of-home advertising. Another one is Regiocast, which is a major German radio group. And the third one is N24, a German media news channel. And what we want to announce today is two things. Alyosha and I actually, who co-founded this fund, one of those is that we are doing now German Media Pool 2, which is the second version of our um, Media for Equity Fund. And secondly, we will be joined by a fourth media partner, which is RTL2. So we will now have four media partners and a significant amount of media to continue investing in ambitious, high-growth startups focused on the German market. I'm going to ask our panel just to stay where they are for a second. Um, I, I, I have a personal announcement. Uh, so as, as some of you know, I was until relatively recently a media entrepreneur myself. And through a combination of hubris, incompetence, and, uh, and, and, and general drunken craziness, uh, that business didn't work out. That one. Uh, however. Uh, what was always good about the company was the editorial, and I'd like to in, invite my, my dear friend Ido, the, the founder and CEO of this, this event, to explain um, something we have up our sleeves. Ido, could you, could you come out for me? I get the big announcement, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Actually, we've never done this before, so this is really fucking cool. Um, yeah, anyways, why, why am I on stage? I think because um, uh, you're, you're I should talk new, about the kernel. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm his new CEO, not only with Hi, but also with the kernel. Thing is, so working with this guy is quite a roller coaster ride, as you can imagine. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. We didn't necessarily agree with like most of his articles from the kernel 1.0 times, nor with like his taste in in general, I don't know, but <laughs> no, seriously though, like, this, yeah, it's the socks. I'm sorry, but no, this this guy is an amazing friend. He's a loyal friend, and he's a great journalist. He's one of the very few people who cares about telling genuine stories about the effect of technology on society, politics, and culture. And that was something that Hans and I always got excited about. We found it high to sort of you know portray the good guys and give the good guys a stage. Guys who are working on things that are truly beautiful and really useful things that make our lives better, easier, and more exciting. Um, 
but quite frankly, you know, there's, there's also the bad guys, right? Guys who take technology to the, to the opposite extreme and, and build stuff that's dangerous and, and damaging and even deadly, I suppose. Um, and the Google Glass, Google Glass no, sorry. Um, and I think that was Milo. I didn't. Um, and I think, I think the kernel has always been a, a really interesting platform to try to explore both the good and the bad. And I think it really deserves a proper relaunch. I think it deserves more than, than being, being this, this, this block that it once was. And I think that, that Hans and I were both really excited about this new challenge. Um, I think we've seen much of the good guys with the high stage. And we're really looking forward to continuing our work with high and, and working on the many other things we do. But the kernel certainly is a personal challenge for me. And I'm really looking forward to be building this media company with this man over here. Um, and I'm going to try to keep him in balance. I'm not sure if it's going to work. But You're not allowed to write about women in tech ever yeah. again. Um. <laughs> Never, ever again. No, but, but you're doing good. You're doing good tonight. And I'm, I'm really happy that we're doing this together. Thank you. Yeah. That's me. Um, I, uh, I'm going to say thank you very much to our panel and invite them to, uh, to, to leave. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much.